Thanks, everyone. Um, first of all, uh, I have a short link here to um, a, a, a little uh, web app I made with uh, Anvil uh, as a way to uh, share the slides with you, share uh, any links, uh, relevant links to the talk. Uh, also collect feedback, and if, if anyone's interested in uh, sort of what the stuff I'm going to be uh, I'm, I'm talking about, then they can just uh, fill that out, and, and they'll they'll receive some contact from me. Um, so if you, if you, I'll bring this up at the end, but if you want to take a look now, you can get hold of the, the slides are being up, uploaded now, so the link should go to that. Um, so uh, and you can give me feedback at the end. Uh, so my name is Ben Nuttall. Uh, I'm I'm now the technical program manager for uh, the Raspberry Pi Foundation. We're based in Cambridge in the UK. Um, I'm a maintainer of a, a few sort of open source libraries um, and projects, uh, GPI, including GPIO Zero uh, and Pi Wheels. Uh, I write things on the internet and uh, you, you can find my links on there uh, to various things. So I'm going to be talking about Astro Pi. Um, so this is the summary of the talk, really. There are two Raspberry Pis on the International Space Station. Uh, we let kids write Python code and we send it to space. Uh, I'm going to be telling you how we do that and why we do that, uh, sharing some cool photos from space and a nice time lapse, and talk about how you can get involved. So first of all, the background of the Raspberry Pi Foundation. You know, a lot of people know us for the computer that we make. Um, we, found, we were founded in 2008, four years before we had a, 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 the product. Um, and that time was generally spent building that product, and that was our idea of what we were going to uh, launch with, and, and we're, we're in... A, all, all around educational charity um, based on um, computer science education and digital making. And we've been uh, making and selling Raspberry Pi computers since 2012, but we do, uh, we do a lots, lots of other things. We, um, we merged with Code Club and Coded Dojo, and we, we support them in growing a network of coding clubs and after school clubs and youth clubs around, uh, around the world. Um, the sale of Raspberry Pi funds our educational mission, but we're not, uh, our activities are not limited to Raspberry Pi. Um, especially things like code clubs. Um, but we have sold 27 million units, so we're um, uh, across the board from uh, hobbyists, education users, and, and through industry. Um, as I say, there's those sales from what we do, uh, so it's really great that we have that sustainable income to, um, to carry on, as well as providing the, the computer that we wanted to, to make available to, to users. Uh, we run lots of youth programs, clubs and competitions, and. Uh, things like that, and I'm going to talk about one of them called Astro Pi. Uh, and in 2018, so 10 years after we were founded, we were awarded uh, a, co a contract from the, the British government to create the National Centre for Computing Education um, uh, as part of the uh, Dep Department for Education. Uh, so we can, um, it's really great that in, in just 10 years we've kind of become, um, you know, the go-to people in, in the UK for, uh, you know, for this kind of thing. So AstroPi was um, developed in 2014, and it's kind of a combination of the fact that ESA, the European Space Agency, they run education programs to get people, kids interested in, uh, in space jobs in the future. Uh, Raspberry Pi Foundation, obviously, do, we run education programs, so we decided to collaborate on one. And that year, Tim Peake was the, the first British astronaut uh, for many years to go, go to the ISS. Um, and Tim is an incredible STEM education advocate uh, and ambassador. Uh, so we were, you know, we were interested in working with Tim, um, and we kind of thinking, well, what can we do? Uh, what kind of program could we run with ESA? Um, was, maybe Tim can pay, take a Raspberry Pi to space with him, and he can, they, they can run, uh, we can run code that kids have written uh, on, on that Pi, and he can be involved. And that's essentially what happened. So we started to look at what we could do. The Raspberry Pi in 2014 looked like this. This is the Raspberry Pi 1 Model B+. Plus. It was the same sort of standard as the original Pi that came out. Um, uh, it's a 700 megahertz uh, ARM v6 and uh, has a video core 4 GPU, half a gig of RAM. And uh, so that's what, we, um, that's what we're working with. Um, we developed a hat, an add-on board for, uh, for the Pi that gave us some interesting sensors. We thought that would be more interesting than um, that uh, we could run kind of uh, science-y kind of experiment things in space. So temperature, temperature, humidity, and pressure sensors, and then... Um, inertial me measurement units, so gyroscope, magnetometer, accelerometer, uh, an 8 by 8 RGB matrix, so you can scroll text across it, do I images and things like that. And there's also a mini joystick. Now, like the Raspberry Pi, this is the thing that, uh, that's for sale. You can buy this, so anyone around the world can, can get access to the same sort of hardware. And these are kind of fun to use in interesting projects. Uh, 
uh, at home as well. And the, uh, the Raspberry Pi camera module, we've got a version 2 uh, that's a higher resolution than this, but this is what we had at the time. Um, it's a 5 megapixel camera, um, but still, still uh, really, really capable. And there's a Python library, a great Python library you can use called Pi Camera. Um, so we need to just put it in a case. Uh, so put all this uh, inside a case. This is, um, it would have been nice to send it up in this case, but apparently it's not space proof. Um, this is what we ended up with. Um, this, is, uh, this is the Astro Pi unit uh, in its entirety. So the, uh, we, we got two of these made, um, and they make the uh, 25 pound Raspberry Pi um, you know, look even, even cheaper. The case cost about 5,000. And um, so we've got a few buttons on there so they, they can be operated by the, uh, by the crew if we, they need to press a button to, to run a pro program or something like that. Um, and the little red um, uh, thing over the joystick there, that's actually, um, we'd actually made this case and the, the mini joystick from the sensor would actually stick through. And at one point Issa sort of said to us, oh, it's, we don't really like having kind of pointy metal bits on, on objects. Can you, can you cover it with something? And like a couple of the engineers in my office were like running around the office sort of looking for something. And, um, I'd actually had uh, a Lenovo ThinkPad uh, that had broken, um, and I, I, it was sitting on the side, and they sort of opened it up and went, oh, we can use one of these, and picked the, uh, the little nipple off the, <laughs> off the keyboard, um, and they had to buy another one, but mine went to space. <laughs> so how do you get it to space? It's basically a big pile of paperwork and a big rocket. Those are not to scale, but not far off. Um, and yeah, uh, we... We sent that space. Tim went to space in a separate rocket, and we both made it. Uh, so we've got um, so we've got those two um, in action there. They uh, they use the uh, the bogan arms that they they sort of hold the laptops on on the side of the uh, the station. They don't use tables. Um, they kind of use these arms to hold everything in place. So uh, so we have two of them up there, and they can they can move them to different modules if they want to to do something different or have them point out the window. Um, and so the camera is actually embedded in the back, so it points out the back. And so we, we ran a few different competitions. Uh, so the first one uh, was just to kind of let's see what we can do and let people come up with their own idea and do something. Um, but it was just the whole sort of purpose is it was for kids to get their code run in space. And um, the last few years we've run uh, two distinct missions, one called Mission Zero, one called Mission Space Lab. Um, and we've been running these annually since 2015. Uh, we also, we, we always, so the first year, um, Tim was the Astro Pi astronaut. He was the ambassador, and um, we, we've had a different one each year um, for, from a different sort of represented country. Uh, so Tamar Pasquet from France, and Alex from Germany, and uh, Fabio from Italy. Uh, and they've been the, um, the sort of figurehead uh, for the program uh, during, their, during their time. So Mission Zero uh, is actually just done in a web browser. So it's really, really low barrier to entry, really simple to, to get started and, and enter. There's a website called Trinket, which um, uh, is Python in the browser. And you, um, they made an emulator for the Sense Hat. So when you run the same Python code that runs on a Raspberry Pi to control the Sense Hat, um, it runs your code on the LEDs there. And you can also use sliders and things to, um, to emulate the temperature going up and down, things like that. So uh, there are about, about 5,000 or so entries for that this year, because it's really, really easy to, to get involved, and it's open to anyone from the uh, ESA countries. Uh, so you get 30 seconds uh, of runtime, but you submit your code through, the, through Trinket. It comes to us, um, we test it, and they, they get run in space, so everybody gets their, their slot. Uh, you, it's just kind of hello world. You could write messages, you can you know, do pixel art, uh, you can use conditionals and things, kind of basic stuff, but uh, you don't have access to, um, you have access to the sensors, but not the camera. You can't log any data, there's nothing taken back, and you, you can't use the camera. So it's just, as I say, just hello world. Um, so really, really good for younger kids. And you get a certificate at the end that uh, has a, a map on the back um, showing you where the ISS was when it ran your code. So the gray, gray line is the path of where, where it was going, and, um, and that uh, the little red bit in the middle is where it was during the, the 30 seconds that your code ran. And then Mission Space Lab is kind of much more involved program, sort of takes the whole academic year to, to do. Uh, but uh, what you end up with is a three hour runtime on the ISS. Um, you come up with an idea for a, a science experiment, something you want to do. And that's uh, you submit that as part of the idea phase. Um, 
you, you come up with the idea and you, and you submit it to us, and we, uh, we analyze it and judge your idea based on its sort of feasibility, scientific merit, and things like that. Um, and then the next phase, we, we, if, you know, the successful ideas, we send them a kit, so they get a Raspberry Pi and a sense hat and a camera. Um, and they, so they have the same uh, equipment that's in space, and they, then they have some time, a few months, to develop their code, write, write everything up. We, we give them an image that's kind of replicant of what, what's in space, uh, with the same libraries installed and things. We kind of choose um, two certain libraries we think would be useful and let them uh, use those. And then, um, then they submit their code, we test it, we, um, we, we analyze their code and check that uh, they're sort of still doing what they originally said, that kind of thing. Uh, there's two different themes to the, uh, the program. They, uh, there's one called Life on Earth, which is about studying life on Earth from, from space. So looking, and you, that one you're looking out the window, you can take pictures of the Earth. Uh, and Life in Space is, is on the other Astro Pi unit. It's inside the station, and you're reading the sensors and things and thinking about what, uh, uh, what life is like in, in, as an astronaut. So looking at the, um, the, the, set, the, you know, the sensing and the environment in the space station. Um, and then they, uh, they, have, um, they run their code, they get their results back, so if they've logged any data, if they've taken any photos, they get those back. Uh, then they have some time to write a report on their findings. They can do further analysis, so they can write some more code to do some more graphs and, and things like that. Um, and they write their report, they send their report in, we judge the reports, and then we have some overall winners. And they, they all get certificates showing where they, uh, their uh, program ran, um, over, th over three hours, so they kind of get two, pretty much two whole laps of the Earth in that time. So you can see the, the path of where that's been. So it's kind of a uh, look of the draw, whether you're, if you're looking to look at cities or look at um, land or, or something like that, then look of the draw, whether you go, you know, you might spend a lot of your time over the ocean or something like that. There's also nighttime phases, so when the ISS is on the other side of the, the Earth from the sun, uh, everything goes black. Uh, but in three hours, you've got a good chance of, of hitting something interesting. Uh, so um, a lot of mission space lab ideas kind of, um, so things like detecting crew presence with sensors. So it's about, you know, think kids thinking, um, you know, what, what, have I, what have I got available? I've got temperature sensor, I've got humidity sensor, we've got pressure, um, we can tell the orientation and we can tell acceleration, things like that. Um, and they can, they can kind of check the conditions, uh, and they can decide, well, what can we use? Could it, could it be that if the humidity um, sensor rises suddenly, if there's a spike in the humidity sensor readings, maybe that means you know, that an astronaut has, uh, has drifted past. Um, and I, and it, it's about getting them to think about what they can, what they can use with the limitations they have. Um, they, can do, uh, they can log data and just kind of see what happens. They can analyze that back on Earth and look at any patterns or see if they can uh, spot anything interesting that took place. Um, they can, uh, if they're taking pictures out of the window, they can um, do time lapses looking, at, looking down at the Earth. Um, and a lot of the ideas they come up are kind of are based around global issues like climate change. That we have a few people, a um, few teams uh, looking at uh, wildfires, see if they can spot evidence of wildfires in the photos. Things like forest depletion um, and the, looking at the greenery of, of uh, look, looking down at, uh, at, the, at the continents and, um, and color, color analysis, that kind of thing. And also things like shrinkage of, of lakes. So if they look at archived photos from, from ESA and from NASA, compare them to any ones that they took and kind of relocate uh, them and, and do comparisons. Kind of really interesting that they have these kind of really, really big ideas that they want to, want to think about. Uh, so libraries that we, we kind of install, so obviously things like Pi Camera and the Sense Hat library. Um, there's, uh, there's various uh, alternatives, but we, we, we've been using FM for um, the ephemeris, ephemerate data, so um, finding out where, where the ISS is at, at any given time. Um, and then things like reverse geocoder to, to locate that to, to the nearest city or something. They can log that data and kind of keep that, or they can look it up. Uh, later, because the, the path of the ISS is something you can look up, you know, um, retrospectively. Um, things like GDAL, um, geospatial, obviously uh, NumPy, SciPy, Pandas, and stuff like that. Uh, we also have TensorFlow, uh, OpenCV, Scikit-Learn, Scikit-Image, and we do get kids using uh, libraries like that. We've had um, people train machine learning libraries to spot things like wildfires, like I said. Um, 
and, and deploy those. It's really interesting to see how advanced these, some of these programs can get. So uh, the process for how uh, Mission Space Lab works, uh, we send uh, a RASP, RASP an image that we've created, installing all these libraries and all, all the kind of modifications and things and all the tooling that we need to, to launch their programs. We do all that work, we send it to uh, ESA. Uh, they do a lot of, um, they do security hardening and, and sort of check, checking things over. So we are actually on the ISS LAN, so we have lots of rules to obey. Um, and uh, we, uh, we test, uh, we, we get the image, uh, image running uh, in flight, and um, you know, we look to see if there's any issues with connect connectivity and stuff like that, so we do a bit of um, Earth to space debugging, which is quite fun. Um, we actually had an issue this year where the, we were using a, 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 we're using a Wi-Fi dongle, because when they, when they put it in the window, they want to be able to transfer the files as they're recorded back to um, a, a Dropbox server on the, spa on the station and then they can downlink it from there. Uh, we'd been testing on a Wi-Fi dongle with the exact same product ID and the same packaging and the same serial numbers and stuff like that, uh, but it turned out to be an entirely different chip on the inside, so the, the kernel drivers that we built for the, for the Wi-Fi driver just turned out to be completely incompatible, so we had to try and find the right one with the right USB IDs and um, uh, you know, re remake those kernel modules and do a separate payload to send the, uh, send the new Wi-Fi drivers. So we have lots of fun things like that uh, to deal with. Um, so, we, yeah, so we test the, uh, the, the Astro Pi in, in flight, we resolve any issues, and then uh, at a later, later stage, once the kids' code uh, has been come in and we've judged it, we then uh, do a payload where we send the, send the student code in, uh, in a zip file, we you know, extract that, and give uh, ESA the, uh, these op operatives uh, all the instructions to what they need to do to run that. Uh, the, the student code then runs, and we're logging uh, what's going on the whole time, and we tra transfer any output from that and the logs um, to the ISS Dropbox server. We, uh, we're then able to downlink files to Earth, and then ESA send them to us, and we distribute them um, uh, to, the, to the teams. Uh, uh, but we also, when, when we're receiving those files, we're, we, we actually check through all the, the syslogs and we, we find you know, some, some errors in the code that weren't caught in testing. Um, and we, we, we get the chance to, to rerun some of those if we're lucky. Um, so we, we literally have things like um, kids who've you know, divided by a, a, a value. And if that value is from the accelerometer, then it's re recording the g-force. And of course, in our testing, well, that didn't come up, but you send it to space and they're dividing by zero. Um, so that's always fun as well. So some of the, um, the w couple of the winners from this year, uh, they're really interesting. So uh, this is a team called the Fire Watchers from Portugal. Uh, so they're, they were one of, the, one of the teams that I said that was uh, detecting evidence of wildfires. Uh, they used um, open image databases, things like that from, uh, they could get from NASA, and they're comparing images and um, pulling interesting inf information out. And using the, uh, because it's an infrared camera uh, that, that, that's looking out the window, they can, um, there's extra information they get from, from the near infrared. So they can analyze vegetation and plant life and, and do a lot of maths and stuff on that too, um, to get some information out. Um, and they end up with some really cool, uh, really cool looking pictures as well. Uh, another a team from Poland called the Happy Pie. Um, they were analyzing photosynthesis and, uh, and the observability of underwater life. Um, they've got some really interesting kind of fractal images on uh, the, the, the sort of mountainous landscapes and things like that, and um, did some, again, did some anal post analysis on their images, um, which is really cool. The winners all get to um, get together and have a, a webinar with, with a former astronaut um, and ask them questions about things. Um, uh, which is which is really interesting for them. Uh, here are some some photos that were taken in, in the in the last couple of years. So I'll just skip through some of these. Some really interesting sort of cloud stuff and uh, sort of landscapes and coastlines. That's kind of the sun, a really odd angle, kind of hitting across some. Uh, so I can't tell if that's land or cloud. You got really interesting sort of hurricane-y looking stuff and. Uh, big ice, patches of ice. Uh, this is a selfie I took. Uh, which is kind of cool. Uh, and there are, th these three are, um, this is actually from, from this year. There was a team that 
managed to capture this, and there are three images um, of the, it was the, uh, the Sawyer's module docking with the ISS, and it was just really, really look, uh, lucky timing that they, they managed to capture it. They're looking down at Earth, and the Sawyer's is sort of slowly reaching and toward, coming towards the ISS, which is just uh, really, really lucky. And so um, another thing we're um, considering is, is to add a, a third mission. So this is something we're probably going to be piloting in the, ne in the, next, uh, in the next run. Um, something that sits between Mission Zero, the really easy uh, low barrier to entry competition, and Mission Space Lab, which kind of takes, takes up your whole time for the year. Uh, something with you know, less time commitment than that. Um, varying levels of difficulty, perhaps. Um, and something that doesn't require ISS involvement. So what we did was we logged uh, logged a load of data this year. Um, we ran some extra experiments, log, logged data. We took photos, so we've got a kind of a good bank of, um, of images that we can use. And uh, we're looking to do kind of small periodic challenges that people could drop in and out of um, and do rather than having to commit to doing the whole the, the project for the whole year. Uh, so this is something we're considering this year because the uh, working working with the ISS is really really cool and it's. It, it makes it really interesting, but uh, it's, it's a lot of work to, to make this kind of happen. So anything that we can do to, um, to run more activities without that involvement would be, would be really good. So as I say, we, we logged uh, 24 hours worth of data. Um, so you, you know where the ISS was at all the time, and we logged all the sensors and took a time lapse. This is actually one of, one of the images that came out of it. Um, so yeah, that's something we're going to be piloting and kind of putting out challenges so that uh, people can try um, if we give them something to think of, a bit like kind of Project Euler stuff, but based on data analysis of this, of this, of this data. Um, so, so how can you help? So come and talk to me today if, if this, this is interesting to you or you, you just want to know more. Um, share your ideas with me for these challenges and that kind of thing uh, and share your interest. Um, you could, anyone in this room could mentor a young person or a group when the challenge is launched. They, we, we, start the, we launch everything in September, so Mission Zero will open. You can, you know, if you've got kids, you can let them go go to Trinket and uh, and uh, do Mission Zero and submit their code, and they they'll get their certificate towards the end of the year. Um, but you can you can mentor a, a group doing Mission Space Lab, so actually help them, you know, if they're doing more advanced stuff. Um, having having access to a professional Python programmer would be really advantageous and be really re rewarding for you as well. Um, and a good way to actually do that in a sort of formal way is um, to co volunteer at one, one of the code clubs or coded dojos. So if you look at those websites, you'll, um, you'll be able to find more about how you can get involved locally. Uh, and you can always contact me if you want to, uh, me to give you, give you some pointers. Uh, if you've got kids yourself uh, in, their, in school, you can talk to their teachers about AstroPy, tell them about it, um, and, and offer, offer your support as well. And watch AstroPy.org and, and Raspberry Pi and AstroPy on Twitter for, for general updates. And again, the, the link uh, to the, the slides, the links, feedback, and, and interest. So if, you, if you're interested in following, me following up with you about this, if you want to know more about volunteering or, or getting involved uh, with AstroPy, you can, you can fill out the form and, and contact me through there. Um, so I'll just leave this video running. Uh, this is... This is um, I've cut out the nighttime parts, so you just see the, uh, the transition there. But this is, this is a video from three hours, uh, one of our three hour runs on the ISS. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm ready to take questions while this, uh, while this is running. Thank you, Ben. Uh, we have five minutes for questions. Please go to a, a microphone near you. Thank you for an interesting talk. Um, what's the kind of breakdown, geographical breakdown, of the countries of the children that are entering this competition? Um, is there a high proportion from any particular country? And also, from the analysis of these um, experiments, has anyone sort of found anything particularly um, you know, particularly interesting from analysing their data? Um, I'm trying to think what, what I know about the, the country breakdown. I don't really... I, I, I don't really have it to hand, but I know... I mean, there's obviously a big um, participant... Uh, a big number of participants in the UK, because we're based in the UK, and it's a lot of our, the stuff that we do 
is, you know, is in English and it is, is, local, is local to us, um, it's easier for us to reach people. But we do have, uh, ESA do operate in various countries as well. They do a lot of outreach to, towards AstroPi. I can't really think of off the top of my head what the, there is, there is, a, there is a good spread across the ESA countries, across Europe. Um, I can't quite think of what the distribution is like. Um, on the second question, um, th there's, a lot, th there's lots of interesting things if we, if we look through the ports, reports and we get, um, uh, we got something like 50 reports or something this year. Um, there's, there's interesting things that people have found in things like uh, if they were looking at uh, forest depletion and, and, and lake, lake depletion and things like that, there have been noticeable uh, discoveries that they've that they've found. Um, there's lots of things like that. Um, so yeah. Do you publish the code at all? Um, we don't. The uh, we 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 sort of put that down to the the mentors to whether they want to do that. Any more questions? Uh, what what sort of connectivity is there? Was you, you mentioned a. Dropbox. So, what kind of connectivity is there up and down between the space station and Earth, and how is it um, how is it managed? You know, presumably, you can't just add any old thing in there. Is that strongly strictly policed as well? Yeah. So, the um, uh, there's a a company that used to work with that do all the operations, the, the technical operations and things. Um, they do pretty much have um, any any time access. So when these experiments were running, they were running for several days, and we were getting daily updates from we were getting syslogs and and stuff like that, and we were analysing what was going on. And um, so we yeah we we did have that having that having that Dropbox made it a lot easier because that's uh, that's wired and it's it's a, it's a um, it's easy to, for them to reach that. Uh, but they they do have a kind of solid. I don't know what kind of speeds they're getting or anything like that, but um, it's, yeah, it's, um, and the, the downlink of, of the files, there's several gigabytes um, at a time, and we're getting that quite quickly, yeah. Um, more like um, a personal curiosity, has there been any uh, project that turned the camera out there instead of towards the Earth that interpret what's happening beyond the Earth, like in outer space? Uh, so they they don't have the opportunity to do that. They just the the Astro Pi is placed in the window, looking at pointing at Earth. So they they don't have the opportunity to look at a different angle. Um, unfortunately, we we've, we've it's it's quite difficult to organise things like that. So we we can't we don't have a lot of flexibility. We just have to kind of get what we're given. But um, it would be really interesting if we, we we have been talking about about that and see if we can get capture the uh, the um, the curvature and things like that. We have time for one more question. Uh, it's just out of curiosity. So thanks for a nice talk first. And uh, how does the data compare to the data available in the public domain? So your next task is data analysis task, essentially. So I'm just curious if kids could grab something similar or is it some unique data set essentially you have? Um, I mean, I, I can't really say that there's any difference because it's it's um, it's just it's just data. Um, uh, you know, any 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 um, collected data is going to have differences, but there there's no distinct observable. You know, uh, do you do you get the data from ISS or any other space programs? Sorry, what, what do is, you mean? Is such data from sensors and uh, cameras available in public domains? Sensors are, are on on the um, sensors. On the station, or yeah, yeah. Um, I, I have no idea. I'm just curious. Uh, I'm not really sure. Um, <laughs> okay. The um, um, I mean, the the, the if the, if there's sensor data available, um, it would be interesting to compare it. I haven't done that myself. But. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. Um, you